Chapter 24 Bloody Sunday Part 1 5 a.m. Even at that early hour, it was perfectly light, and the air was rapidly warming up in readiness for what was going to be another scorcher. A pond in a disused quarry shimmered as tadpoles, newts, and pond skaters streaked up and down its glassy surface. But out of place in this newly formed natural environment was the twisted metal handlebar of a bicycle that gleamed and sparkled in the shallow still water. Its mirror-like reflection exactly doubled its size. The grotesquely disfigured handlebar pointed up to the clear blue sky as though to admit its presence. And as every hour passed, more and more water evaporated from the previously flooded quarry pond. And in turn, more and more of the stolen bicycles would see daylight again. And it would be a hiding place no longer. 8 a.m. PC John Sargent leant on an old wooden gate and stared through the heat haze to the hillside fields beyond. He scratched his graying ginger beard and addressed the scruffy-looking farmer who stood at his side. Would you like a sweet, Giles? he asked as he unwrapped a mint humbug and popped it into his mouth. No thanks, John, replied Farmer Giles, who despite the early morning heat still wore his tweed jacket and woolly hat. So, Giles, what you're saying is that you saw them entering the field through this gate then, said the policeman in a more professional yet still friendly tone. Aye, we did that, John. And can you describe these lads? Aye, we think so we can. PC Sergeant held the farmer's arm and stopped him from answering. No, no, no. Let me guess, Giles. One has longish dark hair, parted at the middle, a fit-looking young'un. And the other, he's a bit taller, with fairish ginger hair. Both about fourteen. Aye, we well, reckon that same down to a T. Yeah, I thought so, said the wily old PC, scratching his beard again. Now then, Giles, can you show me where they went with these bikes? Aye, we well, reckon so he can. Follow me, John. Farmer Giles opened the creaky wooden gate and set off over the fields towards the now dry and cracked, almost empty pond in the disused quarry, retracing the boy's exact footsteps to the evidence that was now all too visible. 12pm The sun rose higher on that Sunday, but this was to be no ordinary Sunday, for it would be known in Braithwaite folklore as Bloody Sunday. It was the day that would change all of our lives forever. Time can blur a memory and add or take away the smaller events to create the eventual memory. But not on this occasion, because even after all these years, I can still remember every minute detail. It was the day a truce was drawn with our rival gang, the Cow Riders, and all the attention and aggression was focused on the annual cricket match. And it was there that this terrible event occurred. The cricket match was to start in just two hours' time, but Unusually for Harold Spider, this was far from his mind. He was going to try and get there, of course, but for the moment 
he had a much bigger fish to fry, for he was now stood at a set of very ornate iron gates, anxiously fiddling with the tie that he'd borrowed from his father. His heart pounded furiously and his mouth dried as he wandered nervously up the driveway of the hugely intimidating house. He peered into the large open garage that was detached from the detached house, and he found himself saying, Jesus, that garage is bigger than our house. An ornamental lion stared up at him and seemed to growl silently. Harry glared back at it. What the hell are you looking at? he asked menacingly, and he growled out loud at the lion. Rawr! Are you mental or what? said a voice. Harry jumped and stared in disbelief and waited for the stony grey creature to speak again. Oi, you, dum-dum, I'm talking to you, said the voice again, but this time... He had more of an idea of where it came from. He turned to his left, and standing at the back of the garage was a sweet-looking little girl of around nine years of age. She was dressed in jodhpurs, riding hat, and a cute little quilted jacket, and was carrying a leather saddle. Harry recognised her as the girl that was sat next to Victoria in the back of the car on the day they'd first met. So he smiled at her and said, Oh, hello little girl. I thought you were a lion. Are you going horsey riding then? The girl looked down at herself, and then at her saddle, and then at her riding boots, and replied, Well... What the feckin' hell do you think, you feckin' braveweight simpleton? Jesus feckin' Christ on a fucking bike! Harry was stunned. The girl looked so sweet and innocent. And also, how did she know that he was from Braithwaite? Never mind a simpleton. Not that I am a simpleton. At least, I don't think I am. Or am I? he asked himself. He then attempted to question Victoria's little sister further. Hey, what's going on here? Am I walking into some kind of trap? Oh, well I don't fecking know, do I? You fecking Braithwaite oik! Why don't you just feck off back to the fecking shithole council housing estate that you've Fucking came from. And she gave him a two fingered salute and stomped off. A brave way oik? Well, that's charming, that is. What even is an oik? I don't think there's even such a fecking, um, such a word. But she'd gone and he was talking to himself again. Okay, well, bye then. Nice to meet you too, girly. And so, now even more tentatively, he approached the ostentatious front door. Ah, well, this is it. In I go, like a lamb to the slaughter, probably. But nothing ventured, nothing gained. Or is that nothing ventured, nothing lost? Well, I'll soon find out. Harry held out a shaky finger and pressed the crown-shaped doorbell. He expected it to play God Save the Queen, but it didn't, because that might have been slightly tacky. A dog yapped loudly. Harry couldn't see it, but he guessed it was closed in at the back of the house, so he was quite safe, for now. He was just contemplating running away, when the thick mahogany door swung open. It was Victoria. Her hair was scraped back and she looked very smart and businesslike. This made him feel slightly scruffy, despite wearing his best jeans and only shirt, and again more confidence 
ebbed away. Hello, Harold. So glad that you could make it. Hello, Vicky. Uh, you look uh, smart. Oh, thank you. And you look, uh, never mind. Come in, won't you? And she ushered him into the house, but he hesitated. Look, are you really sure that this is a good idea, Vicky? You're here now, Harold, so don't be such a coward. And she frowned and grabbed him by the shirt, and in no uncertain terms, she pulled him into the house. And that was the end of that rebellion. Victoria closed the door behind them, and the warmth and hush of the house closed in on him, and he started to feel uncomfortably hot. And although the house was very big, the muffled sound of their feet on the plush carpets gave it a very quiet and claustrophobic feel. He stared in awe at the innards of the house. Expensive ornaments and paintings lined the hallway. He turned and caught sight of a nervous-looking young man stood to his left. It was his reflection in a gilt-framed mirror. It reminded him of himself, and the very last of his confidence vanished, and he bolted for the door. But Vicky grabbed him again and hauled him back with amazing strength. Oh no you don't. We've gotten this far, and there's no turning back for you now, Harold Spider. Harry was taken aback by her forcefulness, and found himself wandering obediently into the bowels of the house. Then he heard a sinister, familiar voice. Victoria, is that your young man? A shiver ran down his spine, and he tried to escape again. But Victoria's grip only tightened on his arm. But, but what is to recognise me? What am I going to do then? They won't, trust me. And even if they do, trust me. What's that supposed to mean? Never mind, I know what it means. And unceremoniously, she shoved him into the sitting room. The sitting room was large and bright and had obviously been designed by an interior decorator. There would never be any darts trophies on display in this environment. Mrs. Simpkins turned to greet Harry. She looked him up and down and judged him all in one fell swoop. He knew, though, that as long as he behaved correctly and didn't say the wrong thing, he would be fine, he told himself. Oh, hello, young man, she said. Hello, um, Mrs. Simpkins, he said. It was a good start. Mr. Simpkins was stood with his back to Harry, looking out of the patio doors, and he spoke without turning. Mr. Spider, I presume? It is indeed, Mr. Simpkins, answered Harry, as loud and as confidently as he could. What do you know about grass, young man? Harry thought the question was a little odd, but he answered it nonetheless. I never touch the stuff, Mr Simpkins, but if you want to smoke it, then I won't judge you, he said again in a loud and confident tone. Mr Simpkins quickly turned around and looked at him, and instantly Harry knew he'd behaved incorrectly and said the wrong thing. Victoria's father hesitated for a second, then said, That's very funny, Harold. I can see you and I are going to get along just fine. Phew, he thought I was joking. One life gone, sighed Harry, as he was ushered on to the brown leather chester field. The sofa creaked as he sat down, and he viewed the lounge from a new perspective. Mr. Simpkins was still standing by the patio window. He was dressed very soberly, but didn't seem to be acting it, as he was swaying slightly as he walked over to his matching Chesterfield chair. 
Would you like a cup of tea, young man? Asked Mrs. Simpkins. Er, uh, yes. I mean, no. I mean, yes, please. I must stop assuming that everything is a trick question, thought Harry. Would you like milk and sugar? Er, uh, yes, please. Um, all of them. Tea, milk and sugar, please. One lamp or two? Harry was beginning to get flustered. Two, please. No, one. No, three. No, on second thoughts, two, please. Then he remembered the advert with the song. Coffee tastes nicer with coffee, mate. So he asked, Do you have any coffee, mate, mate? Just like they did in the advert. You don't have coffee, mate, in your tea, young man, replied Mrs Simpkins bluntly. Oh, no, of course you don't. That's why it's called coffee, mate, you bloody fool. And there was an all-round embarrassed silence. Crap! That's two lives gone, thought Harry. And then it came. The dreaded question. Mrs Simpkins glared over her glasses and asked, Haven't I seen you somewhere before, young man? Harry reeled visibly. No, 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 no. I don't think so. No, 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 no. I would have remembered. Yes, yes, I would have. No, 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 no. He suspected he'd been a little bit over the top with his denial. Oh, I'm sure I have, said Mrs Simpkins, pursuing it further. I never forget a face, but don't worry. It'll come back to me. I hope not, um, so, replied Harry. And that was three lives gone already. But he knew that if he kept his wits about him, surely nothing else could go wrong, could it? Well, yes it could, but not in the way you would have expected. No, it was going to be so much worse than that.